My background, just so you know, my name is Mike Adams. I'm known as the Health Ranger. I am a lab science director. I founded and built a world-class analytical laboratory from scratch. It is ISO accredited. It's recognized around the world for analytical science of heavy metals and uh, food contamination, environmental contamination, and so on. We've done volunteer work, uh, testing over 600 samples of the U.S. water supply. And we've also volunteered our lab efforts to Native American tribes who have been uh, impacted by the EPA's poisoning of their rivers. So, by the way, it's not just blacks that are trying to be eliminated by the status quo. It's also Native Americans and other minority groups that are routinely targeted by not just the EPA, but other groups that we'll talk about here. Uh, I do want you to know that because I am an outspoken science whistleblower, that I am uh, maliciously attacked, defamed, lied about. Uh, I am targeted for intimidation tactics. They try to silence my words. They try to make sure that you can't hear this talk. I've been death threatened. I've been stalked. I have to live a lifestyle of extreme secrecy. And I'm armed 24 seven, including right now. And this is what it takes in our world today to tell the truth about science and medicine, especially when you are uncovering a mass agenda of genocide and eugenics. My interest in eugenics certainly comes in part from the experience of myself being a refugee from, from Hitler and being keenly aware of what was done in the name of science and specifically in the name of genetics. But that happened in this country as well, of course, in a certain sense. The Nazis imported it from the United States, which had a flourishing eugenics movement. At the turn of the 20th century, eugenics was widely accepted in the United States as solid science among the country's top psychologists, scientists, politicians, and social thinkers. And the Third Reich their Holocaust against the Jews was modeled after the Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger eugenics genocide model that continues today in America. There is a Holocaust in America today, and it's a Holocaust that specifically targets black Americans. Officials of Pfizer, a major drug company and vaccine manufacturer, are under arrest in Nigeria. And I'm going to read you a little bit here. And I apologize for the pronunciation here, but Judge Shehu Atiku in the city of Kano said that the Nigerian Pfizer head, Ngozi Idozian, and senior company officials from Pfizer, Lare Bale and Sagun Donguro, failed to appear in court in compliance with a court order that's seeking a $2.6 billion fine from Pfizer, charging that the company illegally tested an experimental antibiotic known as Trovan on children in Kano during a meningitis outbreak in 1996. So you see they use disease to test new drugs. And by the way, you'll find out they, it's, it's, the industry is spreading the disease in order to push the vaccines. I'm the developer of linguistic genomics, which was the first platform on which you could determine the intent of communication rather than the literal artifact of communication. But we've also used that technology for a number of other applications in defense and intelligence and finance. And most notably, in the early 2000s, my company was responsible for bringing down what was at the time one of the largest tax frauds in US history. We maintained a series of inquiries into every individual, every organization, and every company that is involved in anything that either blurs the line of biological and chemical weapons or crosses that line in any of 168 countries. In 1999, patents on coronavirus started showing up. And thus began the rabbit trail. March 2003, panic grips Hong Kong as a deadly new virus sweeps through the city. In 2003, the Center for Disease Control saw the possibility of a gold strike. 
And that was the coronavirus outbreak that happened in Asia. They saw that a virus they knew could be easily manipulated was something that was very valuable. And in 2003, they sought to patent it. And they made sure that they controlled the proprietary rights to the disease, to the virus, and to its detection, and all of the measurement of it. We know that Anthony Fauci, that Ralph Barrick, that the Center for Disease Control, and the laundry list of people who wanted to take credit for inventing coronavirus, were at the hub of this story. From 2003 to 2018, they controlled 100% of the cash flow that built the empire around the industrial complex of coronavirus. The World Health Organization has officially named the, the new novel coronavirus, coronavirus the novel coronavirus the outbreak. outbreak. The, coronavirus the World Health the coronavirus is a pandemic. An international a public health pandemic. emergency. Well, we know that the coronavirus manipulation started with Dr. Ralph Barrick in 1999. The major characteristics of SARS, MERS, and SARS coronavirus, too, it's a good way for you... Ralph Barrick is the researcher at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, who's famous for his chimeric coronavirus research. In 2002, there was a recognition that the coronavirus was seen as an exploitable mechanism for both good and ill. On April the 25th, 2003, the U.S. Center for Disease Control filed a patent on the coronavirus transmitted to humans. Under 35 U.S. Code Section 101, nature is prohibited from being patented. Either SARS coronavirus was manufactured, therefore making a patent on it legal, or it was natural, therefore making a patent on it illegal. If it was manufactured, it was a violation of biological and chemical weapons, treaties and laws. If it was natural, filing a patent on it was illegal. In either outcome, both are illegal. In the spring of 2007, the CDC filed a petition with the Patent Office to keep their application confidential and private. They actually filed patents on not only the virus, but they also filed patents on its detection and a kit to measure it. Because of that CDC patent, they had the ability to control who was authorized and who was not authorized to make independent inquiries into coronavirus. You cannot look at the virus, you cannot measure it, you cannot develop a test kit for it. And by ultimately receiving the patents that constrained anyone from using it, they had the means, they had the motive, and most of all, they had the monetary gain from turning coronavirus from a pathogen to profit. There is a policy of the American government. It's called the Kissinger Report, which was produced in the mid-70s. And it explicitly states that uh, the purpose of the foreign policy in Africa was to uh, reduce the, the population because they have great mineral resources there. At the time, Kissinger and those involved with the Carter administration wanted to shrink the population, make sure that the Africans do not develop and do not use the resources for themselves because we in the States, we need them. There is a, a concerted effort of foreign powers to uh, control the population of Africa. Now, continuing with the vaccine agenda to exterminate blacks from the world. Some children did survive the botched vaccinations last month and will recover, but 15, all under the age of five, died from fever, vomiting, and diarrhea. Human errors contributed to the unfortunate deaths of the children. How can you believe Big Pharma but not believe these parents when they tell you that their children have been injured by Big Pharma. I don't care how big this corporate machine looks. As a parent, I can tell you, these people will never stop fighting for their kids.
In Africa, there are groups that provide vaccines to young African women. And these vaccines are often disguised as tetanus shots. And this is done usually in conjunction with UNICEF, you know, the, global, the global group, UNICEF, and also Kiwanis International, which is supposed to be you know, a community group across the United States and elsewhere. They have a project that they've used to give tetanus vaccines to black women in Africa. The, the name of this project, and I kid you not, I'm not making this up, the name of the project is the Eliminate Project. The Eliminate Project. What are they eliminating? Turns out that various Catholic mission groups that are pro-vaccine and that have been administering these vaccines to young women across Africa sent some of these vaccines to laboratories for analysis of their composition. And there, they were shocked to find that a very high percentage of these vaccines are being laced with covert sterilization chemicals. This is a fact. This is openly admitted. This, in fact, they blew the whistle on this. They went public with it. The U.S. media didn't report this. But outside the U.S., this is widely, widely reported. Uh, in fact, we've covered it on Natural News. Uh, the Catholic bishops in Kenya, they actually urged the Kenyan Ministry of Health to uh, block vaccines from UNICEF and the World Health Organization because the World Health Organization approves of these covert sterilization vaccines. Isn't that interesting? A Facebook post quickly spreading online claims a top Pfizer researcher is raising concerns about a potential COVID-19 vaccine. Bob Segal with our verified team looked into the claim that the vaccine could impact fertility. Yes, this is the question that's been flooding our Verify inbox. Does the COVID-19 vaccine cause sterilization in women? And this is why so many people have been asking that question. It's a Facebook post that's widely circulating right now, claiming a head researcher for vaccine manufacturer Pfizer is warning that the company's new COVID vaccine would cause sterilization in women. Here's what we know about that social media post. Michael Yaden did work for Pfizer until 2011 in the company's Allergy and Respiratory Research Unit. That's according to the British doctor's LinkedIn profile. And Yaden, along with a German doctor, did send a letter to the European Medicines Agency asking the EMA to stop clinical trials of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine. They said the vaccine might block a protein that's important in the formation of a placenta. And the doctors claimed that could possibly possibly result in vaccinated women essentially becoming infertile. While the social media post implies the vaccine will cause infertility, that's not what the doctors actually said. Their petition raises questions, using phrases like, if the vaccine works a certain way, it could lead to infertility. Is that a real possibility? Well, 13 News reached out directly to Pfizer for answers. The company's response? Not exactly helpful. Simply stating, we are not commenting on that. Now, in case you're having difficulty believing any of this, let's go to the news. Let's go to what's being widely reported. Next, North Carolina moves toward compensating victims of a sterilization program that lasted more than four decades. Ray Suarez has the story. North Carolina was by no means the only state to have people sterilized against their will, but it was among the most aggressive in pursuing the policy. Roughly 7,600 people were sterilized between 1929 and 1974, many of them poor, sick, uneducated, or institutionalized, sometimes through force and coercion. The vast majority of the procedures took place in the years after World War II, when other states pulled back from such programs. The state apologized for the offenses in 2002. Today, a task force voted to pay the remaining living victims $50,000 apiece. We look at the history and today's decision with one of the principal activists working with the state's task force. Charmaine Fuller Cooper is the executive director of the State Foundation for Victims of Sterilization. Welcome to the program. How did North Carolina first get involved in sterilizing people? North Carolina first became involved in the whole sterilization procedure at the height of eugenics in America. At the height of eugenics, we had approximately over 30 states that had sterilization programs or laws, with Indiana being the first state. 
ironically, North Carolina actually didn't sterilize as many people in the early years like other states. But after World War II, North Carolina became very aggressive. But after World War II, eugenics, that is, keeping people who are judged to be inferior from having children, was thoroughly discredited. How come North Carolina continued with the program for almost 30 years?